For ease of flow in this exhaustive overview of Pet Sounds, we'll be talking about the most important aspect of the album, its musical innovation and influence, in part three. For now, we'll continue through the timeline of the album's recording and release, focusing on the actions and reactions of the Beach Boys and Capitol Records in real time. So we have Brian, he's got his groove back, and he's in the studio, and he's working on this radical new vision of the most progressive pop album up to that point. The band is out in Japan touring their hits, and they come back and they, they hear this music for the first time. What's their reaction? Well, conventional wisdom goes that the reaction of some of the guys, particularly Mike Love, wasn't that great. And there's been a lot of talk about how the band during this era increasingly began to frustrate Brian's artistic desires. This is something I want to discuss in depth because I think as fans of a band and of, as fans of a certain type of artistic expression, it's very easy for us to just focus on what we want to have happen. And what we what we'd like to hear you know how we would like to rewrite the history of a band how we would like another hit and another of what a band did that we really like and the effect it has on the people that make the music and how they're living their lives and how they're expressing themselves and their need to stay alive and stay viable financially we kind of hand wave that away because it's not our problem we're just sitting at home listening to the record we don't really care um, and as a fan of certain types of music I completely get that as a musician and someone that's played in bands all his life and has worked with a lot of bands including some people that were pretty famous you you cannot ignore the political aspect of making music it is it's like any other job you know, it's just as important how you get along with the people you're working with as the work that you do, because you need everybody on board. So, Brian and the Beach Boys had been living very separate lives and increasingly separate from one another since Brian's retirement from the road. By the time the band came back to do Pet Sounds, they had been estranged is too much of a word, but they hadn't really been in each other's lives. And so Brian just goes, here's this, this is what we're working on. So if you put yourself in the band's shoes and you've just come off a tour and you, you've been doing all this fairly easy to digest pop music for people that love what you're doing, and now you've got this thing that's really, really cool, but quite different from what you've just been doing. And by the way, you, and you're not Hal Blaine, you're Dennis Wilson, you're not Carol Kay, you're Bruce Johnston, who just picked up the bass last year. You know, you're, you're gonna have to go on stage and with just four people, make some facsimile of this music that's being recorded under your name in a few months. You've got lyrics that are not just unusual for you, but they are they don't seem as relatable to your core audience, which is 60s teenagers, as what you've done up till now. You're going to have some concerns. And I think Al Jardine put it best, when because when he put this into perspective, this was his quote, there was a lot of adjustment. It wasn't that we didn't want to do it. And I think that's accurate. I think, I think the band just went, what's going on? Because, you know, they, they, all of a sudden, Brian's making them do stuff over and over and over again. All of a sudden, they got this outside lyric writer. All of a sudden, they got all this stuff. It just hits them like that. Um, now, it, it's, it seems very clear to me that there's a hierarchy in the band of who was most into the music and who wasn't. Uh, Carl and Bruce clearly were the ones most in tune with Pet Sounds. Dennis was having his own period of awakening because when they were on the Japan tour, 
Bruce Johnston taught him properly how to play piano and Dennis would very quickly progress into doing some keyboard playing on the records and writing his own music. So Dennis was kind of starting, the, the light was starting to switch on in his head that hadn't been on before where he wasn't just a hard partying drummer. There was a way for him to express more complicated emotions that previously he, he couldn't express. So it seems like there was some movement on Dennis's part where when he first heard the Pet Sounds music, he was sort of like, well, this isn't what we do. This isn't quite macho enough for me. But he seems to have shifted ground at some point. Um, he w Dennis seems to have been the one most behind the Smile Project, which is the one that came after. And that's interesting because that indicates uh, a, a, a certain movement on Dennis's part, and it also may mean that Smile was more in Dennis's wheelhouse than Pet Sounds was, but Dennis certainly came around to Pet Sounds. I mean, they all came around to Pet Sounds, even Mike. You know, they all are, are very proud to have been involved in the record. But Mike and Al, being the two straightest guys in the band, and perhaps Dennis, were just concerned that this was going to alienate their audience. And Mike, Mike's quote is, it wasn't always pleasant. There were essentially two groups. And, that, that, and that's important because Mike's not having input to this. Brian's got this whole new cadre of people that Mike doesn't necessarily relate to because there's drugs in the mix. And Mike is not with that, mostly. And they're also messing with his livelihood and they're making lyrical statements that he's going to have to sing that he doesn't necessarily relate to or think that are going to translate commercially. And remember, his role in the band as lyricist, it was to take Brian's ideas, which were sometimes a little esoteric, and focus them lyrically to make them more relatable to their teen audience. Now, admittedly, sometimes that was a pretty small change. But if you, if you look at what, what Mike did to a song like I Get Around, um, you know, he wrote a couple lines, three, four lines, but the stuff he wrote was pretty pivotal to making that song more commercial and relatable. It was like he, he did make a, a key contribution, even though it was maybe writing 10% of the song. So Mike wasn't getting to do that, and so they were now sort of all presented with this fait accompli, and Brian's making him do the vocals over and over and over and over again. And so, of course, there's going to be tension. And, and they're not getting input into the music. The music's taking them in a direction that they're uneasy about. They can hear how great the music is, but they're worried that it's not necessarily right for the band. And so in the midst of all this, we have a very strange event. That before the album comes out, and while it's still in process, about three weeks before Sloop John B comes out, which is their purpose-built next single, the thing that's going to keep them afloat, Brian releases a solo single, and it's Caroline No. It's a song from Pet Sounds. This is a very strange thing to happen. I mean, you could say Frankie Valli did the same thing with The Four Seasons, but that didn't happen until the following year, where they had the template of, here's the lead singer, and he's got this separate career outside the band. Um, and the band apparently treated it like a, a, a band single. You have not just Brian, but Carl and Mike recording promo, and Bruce recording promo messages thanking DJs for making the song a hit. The band even attempted to play it a couple times live in, in 66. So this is being treated as, you know, a, a, it's a Beach Boy single under Brian's name. And the, the, the single does okay. It goes to number 32, which I think is actually pretty good considering the song isn't that commercial and they don't have the Beach Boys name recognition. I mean, it's, it's the, the fact that the song gets that high in the charts, given it's just, it's not the most commercial song on the album, and then it's under Brian's name, is kind of significant and kind of interesting. And you wonder how this happened. And I asked around because no one seemed to know how did this get approved? Because the only thing that we've heard about it really is uh, Steve Douglas, who is the sax player in a lot of Brian's sessions, saying that he was really trying to get Brian to put it out. And then he said, quote, it caused problems 
I, man, I just can't tell you. And that was in an interview with David Leaf in the 70s. And uh, Craig Sawinski gave me the missing link that sort of explains to me how this all went down. Steve Douglas was working at Capitol at this point. So now I'm like, oh, okay, because I couldn't understand why, why is Capitol doing this? I mean, they've already got all these issues with what's Brian doing. Why are they splitting the market by putting out this song, which is, you know, some people in Brian's camp thought it had hit potential. Um, Steve Gaines, who is a biography of the Beach Boys, claims that Capitol did it to humor Brian. But I think that the answer is simple, that Steve Douglas really wanted it to happen. Steve Douglas was working at Capitol, and Steve Douglas, between being trusted by Brian and being trusted by Capitol, brought about this solo release. But it seems to have created tensions within the band, which I can see how that would have happened. Um, Sloop John B comes out very soon afterwards, becomes a massive hit, wipes out Caroline No. Um, Wikipedia erroneously says that um, Caroline No uh, debuted at number 37. It didn't. It did about how you would expect it to do. It, it debuted at number 80 and kind of slowly moved up the charts to 32. And when it gets to 32, it was right about when Sloop John B peaks at number three. And then it drops to 37. And then it completely vanishes. It drops from 37 to nothing. It just is gone. So uh, Brian's solo single was sort of wiped out by Sloop John B, but they were also kind of on the charts and peaking at right about the same time. So that's, it's all kind of odd to me, but it, do, it does seem clear that Steve Douglas is, is the person that made this solo single happen. Um, but you, you got to wonder why. And I'm, there, there's some, scuttlebutt that maybe at some point Pet Sounds was being considered as a Brian Wilson solo album. And Brian's indicated as much, but I think it was just Brian just responding to a, an interview question, being agreeable as he often does. I don't really believe this is strictly true. But um, I think it's a thought that, I mean, we're going to get into Capital in a minute. I'm going to talk a lot about Capital, but Capital was a label that had basically two big rock acts, the Beach Boys and the Beatles, and they were two of the biggest acts at the time. But most of the rest of their roster was exotica, jazz, easy listening music, a little bit of soul. They weren't really a rock label, you know, in terms of, you know, I, I kind of tried to find who were the big rock acts on Capital in 66, and that wasn't an easy thing to Google, but I couldn't really find any. The biggest non-Beach Boys act in 66 was probably, or Beatles uh, and Beach Boys, was probably Frank Sinatra. It was, you know, jazz, pop, vocal, that kind of thing. Pet Sounds created a, a promotional issue for Capital because it wasn't easily marketable to their teen audience. It was, but it was in line with this whole sort of beautiful music, exotica, pop vocal, this, this more adult um, genre, this more adult audience, had Pet Sounds been released as a Brian Wilson solo album with Brian being branded in that way, almost, this is sort of doing Brian a disservice, but Jackie Gleason, the comedian, had a huge career uh, in the 50s and up to this time as a band leader, making easy listening albums. Opinions differ as to how much Jackie Gleason actually contributed to those records, so I'm reluctant to compare him to Brian, who obviously contributed, contributed a lot more to Pet Sounds than Jackie Gleason. But the concept of, well, I'm known for this one thing, but now I'm going to give you this other thing. Um, it might have solved a, a, a marketing issue for Capital, but the problem then would have been, so where's the new Beach Boys record? Because that's what's going to sell. And... I don't think this was ever really contemplated as a Brian Wilson solo album, but I think to the extent that the label got behind this idea and tested it out, it might have had something to do with thinking about how to market it and if, they, if there could be sort of a dual thing where Brian makes a certain kind of record and he makes teen records for the Beach Boys. Um, but having said that, the timeline doesn't really work out because the, the I don't know that Capital had heard that much of the album yet. Um, so their reaction to Pet Sounds, which was 
nonplussed to say the least, would not have been fully formed. So I, th this is sort of a vague thought on my part, and I think it might have been a vague thought in the air at the time. I don't think Steve Douglas was trying to make Brian necessarily go solo, but as an employee for Capital that was in Brian's corner, he may have seen this train wreck a common, and he thought this might be a way to avert it. I don't know, it's just a little theorizing on my part. And there's another possibility that Capital released the album because they wanted it to fail, because they were trying to dissuade Brian from moving in this musical direction and, and wanted to be able to go, now see Brian, we told you this wasn't that commercial, you know, can you get back to doing fun, fun, fun and whatnot. Again, I don't know that that was the case. And I don't know that there's any evidence of it, but we're going to see pretty soon that Capital certainly wasn't behind this record. So all that is to say that, in my opinion, the band's resistance to Pet Sounds has been a little bit overstated. I do think there was some, uh, but I think it was all quite understandable. And uh, even though the sessions were somewhat tense and there were times when the band didn't want to put in the time, you know, Brian was at that point in their career very much equal to the political demands and he, you know, he made sure they did it and if they didn't do it he was fully capable of doing all the vocals on his own and there's a couple of times when he did that and, you know, he seems to have replaced them with band vocals later, mostly, but there's at least one situation where he didn't. Uh, but there was resistance among the band, but it certainly was understandable given the times, the groundbreaking nature of the music, their prior work, and their commercial and career concerns. I mean, this directly affected them. And it's easy for us to overlook when we're critical of how the band reacted to some of Brian's more adventurous work, that even though Brian's instincts were later proved to be correct in terms of the direction the music world took at the time, that wasn't obvious then. And the band increasingly were just passengers on a plane that Brian was piloting and he'd locked the door to the cockpit. So if Brian was going to take months and months and months to make a record and he was going to make it about regressing to childhood or whatever, they just kind of had to deal with it. But they were going to be the ones that were going to have to go out and sell it to the public. So, you know, they had a right. You know, no, they weren't, they weren't on an artistic equal level with Brian or even close. And they knew that. And they, it's not like they had any better suggestions for what to do, nor did they when Smile came around when things got even weirder. They all knew that Brian was the guy and he was, you know, he was the creative talent of the group. And uh, they all knew that they weren't, you know, about to step forward and say, I got a better idea because they didn't. But, you know, they still were directly impacted by the decisions that Brian made. And we're not just talking about whether you like this or that record. I mean, think of it, don't think of it like you're listening to a record. Think of it in terms of your own job. Whatever it is you do, whether you're a plumber or your accountant or whatever, and your boss starts just counting numbers different. You know, he's, maybe he's got a whole new way of doing math and maybe it's gonna save your accounting business a million bucks and you're gonna be first in your market. But you don't know that and, you, and you're down in middle management going, crap, I might not have a job in a year. That's the exact same situation the Beach Boys were in. They had a right to be nervous. And the only way they could exert any influence on Brian was to just let their concerns be known, and that's what they did. I'm not saying that didn't impact Brian negatively. I'm not saying that didn't hurt the creative process at times. I'm sure it did. But look, most great records, most great movies, most great artistic things, there's some tension. There's some some unfortunateness in the creative process. There's not a lot of great art that doesn't include some great pain and times you want to walk away from it and times you just get frustrated with it, I want to do something else. This is a natural thing to happen. So there was some resistance to the album uh, in some quarters, but every single person in the band uh, later and to the present day is very proud to have been a part of this record. And, you know, that counts for something. So I think the band's resistance to Pet Sounds is a little overstated.
The record company's resistance to pet sounds, on the other hand, I think may be a little understated. And so to get into this topic, on which I have a lot to say, let's start out with the album cover. How did this happen? Besides making the Cooper Black font iconic, <laughs> um, we have this kind of weird picture of the Beach Boys feeding animals at the zoo. And um, it's been said, including by some members of the band, that this is just the worst album cover ever. I mean, it works now because we're so, you know, we've accepted it as being, you know, the deal. But um, it, it was kind of a goofy album cover even at the time. And apparently this was Capital's idea. And there was some sort of a crap title floating around for this album called Our Freaky Friends. And this, this, even this title seems to have originated with Capital, which, if true, makes no sense to me because Capital is here increasingly worried about the timeline things are taken and, and, and probably, you know, seemingly gone off in a weird direction, although I don't know how much they actually knew. And yet, Our Freaky Friends is a, is a title that they're thinking about. Like, what friends? Your friends are the goat? I mean, what? what? hell they go to this weird ass album cover at the san diego zoo and this happens fairly early on in the process it's february 10th um brian's still in the middle of tracking i'm not even sure if the guys have started singing yet so they don't even have uh th they don't even know where this is completely going yet and pet sounds as a title seems to have evolved from this photo shoot as opposed to this photo shoot evolving from the title uh, this seems to be for the Freaky Friends album concept. If this was Capital's idea, I don't, I don't know what the hell they were thinking. You know, I, I could get it if they sent them off to, um, to be on another on boat shoot or something, or if this was their sort of half-assed way of trying to update the band's image without updating it. I, I don't get it. But the bottom line is they go down February 10th. They, they go to the San Diego Zoo. Bruce Johnson's there too, although he's not given clearance to be on the cover because of his contract with Columbia Records as staff producer and with Bruce and Terry. Uh, the band gets in some trouble because uh, they're supposedly abusing the an animals, which the band protests. And Bruce talks about how the animals were just horrible to them. And I, I got to tell this story. So um, I was there when they did the Pet Sounds 40th Anniversary CD DVD set and when they interviewed Al for the documentary part of that, the bonus features. And I don't remember why. It was certainly something to do with Alan Boyd being there and my friendship with him. But I came in with Al and Alan and there was a big poster of the Pet Sounds cover at the, at the front of Capitol Records where they were going to do this interview because it was at the Capitol Studios. And um, Al stops in front of the, the big poster of Pet Sounds. We all stop, of course, too. And Al just starts going off about the white goat. He just, he just is like, that white goat, he just keeps talking about the white goat was just a jerk. Uh, you can see, you know, they're, they're interacting right there, but he was, that was his main topic of conversation was the white goat and how much he hated the goat. So Al does the, interview there's some other stuff that happens i'll tell you about that later and uh, we're on the way out al stops at the poster again <laughs> and he starts going he goes that goat and i leaned in and i said al that goat is dead now and al looked like he felt better <laughs> he laughed a little and left so that's my little connection to this but anyway um so Apparently, uh, Mike Love, I mean, there's, there's some dispute over who came up with the title, but nobody really remembers, but uh, it seems to have been Mike uh, who came up with the Pet Sounds title. And that was partly inspired by them having done this weird ass zoo photo shoot. Um, and it's notable too, you know, I don't want to harp on this too much because I've already gone on a lot about Brian's sort of lost weekend of last half of 65, but Brian's put on a considerable amount of weight. Uh, by the time the new the new photos are being done, you can see that in in the early '66 shots, he's got pretty pretty heavy. But anyway, so Capital's dubious fingers are on this photo shoot, and uh, I don't know what the heck they were expecting to get. Once we get to the point where Brian turns over the album to Capital, there is no disagreement from anybody in the band in terms of their reaction. 
they were not into it. They did not like it. They were kind of like, well, this is great, Brian, but, you know, could we have something more like, you know, I get around to California girls or fun, fun, fun. Everybody in the band, Bruce, Carl, Mike, Al, Brian, every, Dennis, everybody is in 100% agreement. Capital was not into Pet Sounds. They did not know what to do with it. They did not want to re-promote the band in any other way. They didn't, they, they didn't want to do any kind of work to rebrand the Beach Boys. Wikipedia claims, and there's some basis for this in an interview with Carl in 1982, that Capital actually wanted to scrap the album. I find this very hard to believe because they just put 70,000 bucks and they'd been waiting, as I said, 10 and a half months for a new Beach Boys record. Did they really think if they dumped this album in the garbage that Brian was just going to come up with something better? Uh, so I can't believe that they were really going to scrap this because they were going to make some money off this album no matter what. I can't see how it would have made business sense for them to scrap it. but. I don't think they wanted Brian to keep going down this road. Uh, I, I think that's very clear. And, and I want to get back to the fact that Capital wasn't exactly a label that had its finger on the pulse of rock. Now, one of the reasons we revere Pet Sounds was it was very early in the rock and roll game to try and do an album like this. I mean, it kind of was the first rock album like this that wasn't by the Beatles, it, 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 where you just had somebody step away from their the commercial concerns it's just to a unified thematic work of this level of emotional maturity and ambition this hadn't really happened before but it was about to happen a whole lot because that's what 66 going into 67 and beyond was going to be and it was a, it was a very good commercial move looking down the road uh the band didn't see this right away but they did see this a lot faster than capital did i mean as brian points out uh, the band accepted the fact that it was going to be Brian's personal statement and it, they accepted that there was validity to doing art records, to quote Brian. And it took them a little while, probably about a year for some of them, maybe a little more. But they did finally, the, the Beach Boys by the end of 67 knew they needed to change. And they had to because of everything that happened in 67. Rock had completely changed around. Capital being... I think kind of fat and lazy from having lucked out and getting the Beatles and also lucked out with the Beach Boys because because for Capital it's like the Beatles are going to sell themselves but even then we got to chop up their albums so that we have more albums to sell we're going to make them into 12 song albums and have extra Beatles albums because up until 1967 the Capital was screwing with the Beatles as all you Beatles freaks know the Beach Boys you know it was very easy for Capital to visualize what the Beach Boys were California surfing cars woo you know if, as long as Brian kept kept them in that wheelhouse, they didn't care how many vibraphones and glockenspiels he put on his records, as long as they keep having hits. They also didn't care if they just got a bunch of people in a room banging ashtrays, as long as they had a hit. You know, it, Barbara Ann and Sloop John B. couldn't have been further apart in terms of their production value, but they still were something capital could market within the rubric of that whole fun in the sun, la di da thing, right? I don't think Capital wanted to do the work. I don't even think they, they had any appetite for understanding the rock market because as far as I can tell, they the, most of the rest of their stuff was marketed to somewhere else. They just didn't want it. They were just lazy, I think. I mean, it would have been hard. Now, I'm going to briefly and very feebly defend Capital. I think they were absolutely right that this content was going to alienate some of their teen audience. But... This was not Smile, okay? When we get to Smile, we're going to talk about some of the very real issues that that album was going to have in the marketplace. But as, as ambitious and as sort of out of the rock realm, because it's almost a non-rock album, a lot of these songs were, there was a lot of very commercial material here. You had, you had wouldn't it be not, well, Slip John B, of course, right? Um... You had Wouldn't It Be Nice, which made the top 10 in the U.S. You had God Only Knows, which uh, was a massive hit in Britain. Uh, you had a song that, here today, which wasn't released as a single, but with its lead bass line, it's, it's 
basically the proto version of Tommy James and the Shondells, I think we're alone now, which was a massive hit in 1967 and had here today been uh, maybe edited, had the instrumental section edited down, that could have been a very big hit. Uh, there, there's a lot of commercial music on Pet Sounds, even even in the context of the 1966 marketplace. So, what does Capital do? Well, I, I went through all of the Billboard charts of 1966 because I wanted to understand exactly how this went down, and I was just appalled because what happens is in March, you get the dual singles, Caroline No and Sloop John B. And Caroline No goes to number 32, which is like kind of, see, Brian, your little song didn't do very well. But actually, considering the nature of the song, which I would consider the fifth most commercial song on the album, and the fact that it wasn't released under the Beach Boys name, I'm surprised it got that high. 32 is actually pretty damn good. And an indication of how high the Beach Boys commercial profile still was in early 66, because this is another thing I didn't realize until I started doing this show. We think about Pet Sounds as being, you know, the point where the Beach Boys start to decline, but the Beach Boys were so huge in early 66. They were one of the biggest bands in the world. They weren't Beatles huge, as Andrew Doe points out, but they were big. Barbara Ann went to number two. Sloop John B, when it was released, goes to number three. So you are all set for the Beach Boys' first full studio album in 10 and a half months. You got two top three hits that just happened. Barbara Ann in January, Sleep John B in March going into April. So May, we release Pet Sounds. What happens? Nothing. There's no special promotion for the album. As the band points out, the, the, the capital basically just relies on name recognition. And crucially, there's no single. There's no single. Now, I, I think that um, the, the label, like the band, because one thing I didn't say when, when I talked about the band is the band really wanted good vibrations on Pet Sounds. I think they heard that as a hit, and Brian said it wasn't ready. And I think, because Capital, from their internal memos, were very aware of that song. And I have a feeling that they were hoping Pet Sounds would get just... Let's put it out and forget about it, and then we'll make some money on Good Vibrations and something else, which we'll talk about in a minute. They just kind of wanted Pet Sounds out and gone. You know, make a little, few bucks back and let's all... And, and discourage this from happening again. Brian, stop making $70,000 records no one's going to buy. That's what Capital wanted Brian to take away from this. Get back to work. Stop screwing around. That's Capital's attitude. And that's the only thing that explains what happens with the album. Because... Wouldn't it be nice? Does get to the top ten in America, but wouldn't it be nice? Is not released until the middle of July, and before that happens, what happens? Capital releases the best of the Beach Boys, and this is notoriously uh, an act of bad faith and of no faith in Capital in the Pet Sounds album because. Again, I went back through the chart placings of Pet Sounds. And the other thing I didn't realize is it got to number 10, which is good, not great for the Beach Boys because most of their albums had gone top five before this. And it only was in top 10 for one week, which was not, not great. But it was in the top 40 albums all the way through to the end of October, which is what, five and a half months, right? Five months, something like that. So that's, this album hung around a long time, and a good deal of the time it was in the top 20. So the album didn't just go up and piss off. It was, it was in the charts, in the, we're talking the US now, we're not even in the UK yet. It was in the charts in America for quite a long time that year. So it was hanging around. And part of the reason for that was, wouldn't it be nice finally being released as a single in July? But they didn't put out, wouldn't it be nice, until the Best Of album had been out for two weeks. And the Best of the Beach Boys, we, we, it's talked about how Best of the Beach Boys zoomed right up the charts, you know, and knocked Pet Sounds out of the place. That didn't really happen either. It, it got higher than Pet Sounds, and it got up to number eight, and it stayed in the top 10 for a few weeks and not just one. But it wasn't a blockbuster album, and it doesn't seem to have really taken off until Wouldn't It Be Nice 
started to climb the charts. So you ha wouldn't it be nice kind of kept Pet Sounds viable through uh, middle of 66? And it does seem like the rumors that Capital filled orders of Pet Sounds with Best of the Beach Boys and sabotaging the album further, that, that doesn't seem to have a lot of evidence in favor of it. But you know, the evidence of the charts is pretty clear that Capital dumps the Best of the Beach Boys out before they release a single from Pet Sounds. And, and the, the single seems to be a sales driver for Best of the Beach Boys. Now, I grant you, Wouldn't It Be Nice is not on Best of the Beach Boys, but it's confusing the marketplace. So it's almost like they're trying to get people to buy the Best of album by finally putting out a, a track from the album that they're supposed to be promoting. And then they put God Only Knows on the B-side. And God Only Knows still makes number 38 in the U.S., despite being a B-side, but it was number two in Britain. Now, I, I, again, I grant you, it wasn't widespread company practice in the 60s to release single after single from an album, but there was nothing really to stop them from doing it. And with not so many people having bought the album, they could have put it... They could have put out Wouldn't It Be Nice at the same time Pet Sounds came out. Because when Pet Sounds came out, Sloop John B was at number 15 and dropping. So they had nothing going on, right? So there's two months with the Beach Boys having nothing on the singles charts other than Pet Sounds. I mean, nothing on the singles charts at all, really, other than Sloop John B dropping down. So what if they put out Wouldn't It Be Nice in May and then kept Best of the Beach Boys in reserve And then it does what it does, and then they could have had God only knows in reserve for that. And then, you know, if good vibrations didn't come out. And then they got good vibrations, and then they could have really sold pet sounds. But instead they put out Best of the Beach Boys, and did I mention the track list for the U.S. Best of the Beach Boys makes no sense at all. Let me, let me find it right now, and we'll talk about the Best of the Beach Boys briefly because it's not the best of the Beach Boys in any way, shape, or form. It's just a bunch of BS tracks. <laughs> so this is what, okay, so Best of the Beach Boys comes out July 5th, 1966. That's less than two months after Pet Sounds. Surfing USA, hit. Catch a Wave, eh. Surfer Girl, hit. Little Do Scoop, B-side hit. In My Room, B-side hit. Little Honda, hit for someone else. Fun, 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 hit. Warmth of the Sun, album cut. Louie, 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 really? Kiss Me Baby, album cut. You're So Good to Me, album cut. Wendy, album cut. Where's California Girls? Where's I Get Around? Where's Wouldn't It Be Nice? Where's, there's hardly even anything from 65 on here. You're, you know, You're So Good to Me and, and Kiss Me Baby. I mean, clearly, they were planning to do a whole bunch of Best of the Beach Boys because otherwise this track list makes no sense. Because if you look at the British version of Best of the Beach Boys, it's chock full of hits. It's, it's exactly what it should be. And it does huge business in Britain. We'll talk about that in a bit. But to me, not just the release of the Best of the Beach Boys, but the composition of the track list indicates to me that the, the capital was thinking of the Beach Boys as being over. Because they were already, or, or at least, They were over until they could get back in the wheelhouse of what Capital was comfortable promoting. Because there's no reason to do a track list like that unless you're planning to do a best of volume two and a best of volume three. In those days, a best of meant your career was over. So it was a huge sign of bad faith, not just stepping on pet sounds, but Capital saying to Brian, yeah, no, we're just going to sell off the back of what you did already because we don't want this. And it's further evidence of the bad faith of capital is for a long time the narrative was Pet Sounds didn't sell enough to go gold. It was like one of these points of like look at the commercial failure of Pet Sounds. But it did. Retrospectively, it appears that, that Pet Sounds had sold uh, 500,000 copies by the middle of 67. But capital never submitted the paperwork to get it certified. They didn't submit the paperwork until I think 2006. And they were able to make it go gold just on recent sales of Pet Sounds. They, they estimate now that Pet Sounds sold more than 2 million records over the course of its lifetime. It actually sold decently. But for whatever reason, Capital didn't submit for the gold record, which furthered the narrative that it was a commercial flop. To me, it, the evidence all lines up that Capital just didn't want the Beach Boys to go down this road, and they were gonna, it was going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, I do not think 
Pet Sounds would have done as well as their other records because they were alienating a certain amount of their fan base. And they needed to cross a bridge to a more adult audience. And, the, and, and they had started to do that with the hiring of a publicist, Derek Taylor, to remake their image. And this is where you start to see the Brian Wilson is a genius hype happening. And that benefited the band a lot in the future and in what I'm about to talk to talk about what happened in Britain. But Capital did not want to let the band progress. They did not want the band to go down this road. And even though I think Pet Sounds would not have done as well, had Capital made a good faith effort to do what they could with it and to market it properly, I think, wouldn't it be nice? It, had it been released earlier, it would have been a bigger hit. It would have made Pet Sounds a bigger hit. God Only Knows could have been released as its own A-side uh, or been promoted more properly with Wouldn't It Be Nice at the proper time. And Pet Sounds would have done better. Number seven, number eight, something like that. But that's not what happened. Because Capital, from what I can see, the evidence is very clear, they sabotaged this record. So, let's keep in mind that Capital is the Beach Boys label in the U.S. Now, Capital was fortunate enough to be the Beatles' U.S. label, but Capital got that because they were the distribution arm stateside of EMI, the British label, which was affiliated with the Beatles label, Parlophone. Phone. Anyway, that's for the Beatles maniacs to uh, talk about. But the important thing to remember here is that the reverse is true. The Beach Boys only had to deal with capital in the U.S. In the U.K., their label was EMI, same as the Beatles. And the uh, band, as I said, was, you know, on the radar in Britain. Uh, people knew who they were through the I Get Around hit, and you know, but they hadn't really broken through in a big way yet. And here we get an act of heroism from Bruce Johnston. Uh, now, remember, we talked about Bruce. He was a newbie in the band. He came in from uh, a year prior to replace Brian when he left the road. And, uh, but Bruce had been working as a staff producer at Columbia Records. Bruce was an industry insider. He'd worked the other side of the fence. And he had his own set of contacts. He had his own understanding of how the office side of the industry worked. And Bruce had had a bit of an epiphany during the Pet Sound sessions. For the first part of the album, you know, he was a new guy. He was kind of focused on his social life. You know, he wasn't that caught up in the band politics. And then one day he went to hear a tracking session for God Only Knows and a light bulb went off in his head. And to quote him, he said, I wasn't thinking commercially. My soul kicked into high gear. That's kind of a big deal coming from a guy like Bruce, who is condition to think in terms of the marketplace. He was one of the most reliable people in the band to uh, give perspective from the industry side of the fence. But once that light went off in Bruce's head, Bruce became determined to do what he could to get pet sounds across. There wasn't much he could do in the U.S. because capital was going to capital. But the Beach Boys had hired Derek Taylor, who was a very well-known publicist and was working for the Beatles. So Derek Taylor was doing good work for them in the States, getting some good press about Brian's artistic progression and trying to turn their image around. But he had a lot more clout in England. And Bruce also had his own contacts, including Kim Fowley, who he'd gone to high school with and had did some early work with and now was pretty heavily involved in various parts of the music industry in Britain. And he had one more ally, an unlikely one, Keith Moon, the drummer from The Who, the wild man who, in his heart of hearts, always wanted to be Dennis Wilson, who couldn't have been a more different type of drummer as it happens, but um, Keith Moon loved the Beach Boys, and he loved surf music in general. So Bruce decided on the date that Pet Sounds was released in the U.S. and was not scheduled to be released in the U.K. for another couple of months. Bruce decided to take the album to England, and he goes on May 16th and does a week-long junket. He calls up Kim Fowley. He has Derek Taylor set up some connections. Keith Moon pitches in, and pretty much Bruce meets everybody in Swing in London during that week, including uh, the Beatles. And uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney um, get played Pet Sounds 
very impressed. Uh, here, there, and everywhere is a direct outcome of hearing the album early. And uh, basically, there is so much buzz from Bruce's appearance and all the people that hear the album that are industry cognoscenti and the various things Bruce does during his week in, uh, in the UK that EMI Rush releases the album. It comes out on 27th of June and it peaks at an astounding number two and is top 10 in the UK for six months, six months. And then Capitol releases a proper best of the Beach Boys, which makes a lot, which has a completely different impact on the British marketplace. Because remember, they've only had a few hits there. So the, the British best of the Beach Boys actually is the best of it. It's one of the best compilations of the Beach Boys music uh, that existed up until Endless Summer. Because it, it, it does collect all of the Beach Boys American hits for the British audience. And that goes to number two also, because now they're like, whoa, this band's amazing. And the Beach Boys become the biggest seller of albums in the UK for the final quarter of 66. The biggest seller. In fact, they top the year-end poll uh, from one of the music magazines they, as the world's top group. Above the Beatles in 66. The, you know, when we talk about Pet Sounds, the American-centric focus on what happened to the band, Britain was a completely different story. Uh, the, the album was huge. And it... And it, and it put the, the band on the map in Europe in a big way and it basically saved their butts because they would completely collapse in um, America in within a year and their records would would not sell very well for the rest of the 60s but all of their post pet sounds albums uh, did quite well in Britain and Europe uh, up to Sunflower the Beach Boys continued to remain viable hit makers and being able to have that marketplace and being able to tour there got them through some very rough times. If, if Bruce had not made this trip and Derek Taylor hadn't done his job as a publicist and everybody hadn't pitched in and been and if the album hadn't been as good as it was, uh, the Beach Boys career might have completely tanked because um, they, they, there was nothing for them in America for quite a long time after Pet Sounds and Good Vibrations hit because things just went down the tubes. So it's funny when we think about Pet Sounds being a failure because it really wasn't. Uh, it was a failure only in terms of the commercial expectations that were set up in America uh, based on their prior work, which in itself was a result of both the industries and the Capitol Records in particular preconceived notions of how the band should look and sound and their lack of desire to make any kind of reasonable transition because in my view they were lazy and they didn't really know what they were doing um, because they weren't really a rock label they just got lucky with a couple of big bands and they were just coasting on that but Pet Sounds being the album that it was and being as good as it was and falling on an audience that wasn't conditioned to think of the band in a certain way it was appreciated for what it was in its time and basically set up the band's commercial viability for the next several years in a completely different market and uh, kept, I mean, British fans of the Beach Boys to this day are much more in tune with the band's artsier side than American fans are. And if you think about it, there's so much cultural bias at play because the Beach Boys within American culture are thought of as they're almost a regional band. And what I mean by that is they, they are synonymous with the West Coast, with California, with sun and surf, and, uh, and bringing a certain ethos to the rest of the country. And, and for those of you that are, aren't American, let me tell you, my home country is very, very big, and there's lots of places that aren't anything like California. They got a lot of snow. They got a lot of swamps, they got a lot of mountains, they got a lot of cows, you know, depending on where you're at in America. California is California, it's its, its own thing. And the Beach Boys being part and parcel of that um, carries with it a lot of cultural weight. They mean a certain thing to us and it's very deeply ingrained and it's hard to think of them in another way. Now, when you go to Britain, 
they're more generically American. And, and the, the whole ethos of California is wrapped up with the ethos of what's cool overseas about America, which is kind of Hollywood and, and, and what we've given to pop culture. And that doesn't have the, the same level of specificity as the way we Americans are conditioned to look at the Beach Boys and why it took so long for the band to be considered as an artistic entity. Because as I'm going to talk about in a little while, the, the artistic respect the Beach Boys are held in now and the conventional wisdom about their artistry, that happened within my adult lifetime. I can tell you that being a Beach Boys fan in the early 80s at trying to make this case, that was a very tough hill to die on. And, and that was, a lot of that was because of the band's image issues and, and the, the weird ways that it decided to navigate its career after Pet Sounds. But you didn't have that same level of original sin uh, with the way the band is perceived in Britain, you know, because they were coming to Britain late. You know, they didn't break through till 64 and didn't break through fully until Pet Sounds. And so that's how the British looked at the Beach Boys as more of an artistic band that had an American ethos, which, you know, in some ways you're always better off not playing for your hometown crowd because they're going to look at you in a certain way. They didn't have that issue in Britain. And British fans, as Brian Wilson has commented, are just more, much more in tune with the artistic part of the Beach Boys work. You know, so in my opinion, Bruce deserves a frickin' medal for his trip to England. It, it, it's been talked about, but not enough. Because it, it really, had he not done that, I mean, a lot of bad things happened to the Beach Boys in the, the succeeding months and years, but it could have been a lot worse if they hadn't established a beachhead in Great Britain and with it Europe uh, that gave them a, a new lease on life when things in America were very dire indeed. So we can't go any further into the history of the band and the history of the album without going into the next project, Good Vibrations, and the aborted album that followed, Smile. And that's obviously going to be a tale for another day, uh, several other days. But we can talk about the influence of Pet Sounds, and it was extremely influential.